Now, another thing I wanted to ask you about, in, in the exhibit upstairs, there's a map yeah, and a yeah. tent, yeah. and it's about, it seems to be about a measurement. So... <laughs> What was, what was, how did that start? I mean, accepting that you've got this intention, invention yeah. and convention, it seems as if you had an intention, yeah. the invention didn't quite happen, yeah. so where is it at the moment? Uh, yeah, it's finished. That, that tent is a finished piece of work. I don't, it's not my favourite that I've ever done, I'll be honest about that. I don't think it is the best, but I think it's, it, what, what I quite like about that is that it almost feels like one of the, like, it feels like an artwork that's for the artist. Like the other ones, I'm, I, I want to show generally because they feel like they're for a viewer as well. But the, like the video that's in the tent is of the walk that I did and I, took, I used it as a video diary. So the video is a video diary of that. And it's ended up being a bit like a, a bit like an essay to do with the research I was doing. So instead of doing a master's, I took four months out to just read lots of stuff myself and then I went on a, a long walk trying to make an artwork and failed and then had this video at the end of it. Um, but the, the aim was to make a new unit of measurement called the X eater, which was like a meter with, but it's spelt like X eater. Or, that was the aim, and right. it was where it was based on the story behind how a meter was discovered, which was by the Paris Observatory. Um, there was a bunch of there was a guy who did most of it, uh, and then uh, there was a, a younger guy who sort of finished off the last section, where he seemed to ha uh, where a, th a lot of things seemed to happen to him. That I'm not sure are true or not, but. That his story, that part of it was what made me think it'd be funny to attempt to do something like a new unit of management, but what along the way sort of playing with what that was. That didn't work out exactly as I planned it, but um, I think the feel of what I was aiming for still sort of came about because the the the, lo the long story short of what they did was the. Paris Observatory used to be where the Paris Meridian used to go through, it still does but that was what was replaced by the Greenwich Meridian which is what does Greenwich mean time and the Paris Meridian was the basis for a lot of um, discoveries and inventions that were part of quite a inventive period I guess, you know, because the metre now that's that became the first universal measurement and it's Stuck. And that's developed into things like the micrometer and is now... But that, that was based on a, a, a journey in w within France, wasn't it? That, that they, they had two points within France and they, they, they thought they knew how far apart they were. It went through France and, and Spain. Um, but the idea was that the meridian went north to south, so from the North Pole down to the equator, is what they said. And then they... I think they said that they wanted the... the Measurement to be taken from a tenth of that distance, which worked out um, France through to the bottom of Spain, I think. Um, and then they said that the metre would be a ten millionth of that distance. So they had to triangulate the distance from mountain tops all the way down that route, um, which they, they did. It took a long, I think it took about eight years in total. And the last distance through Spain took um, even longer because of what the young chap had to sort of go through the, the funny things he had to go through but the it's like the, the, there's, there's funny things within it like about precision you know it, they, they created this, this measurement which now the precision involved in what the meter has grown into is ridiculous like the to start with they um they standardised the metre by creating sort of metre length poles. Right. And I think they made 26 of them and then had a lucky dip for all the countries to pick out which one they want. I mean, I'm, you know, it's not exactly that. Like and then, but then it changed from, from that, they went through a trial and error process of keeping it as exact as they could. So it started off with just a, a, a bar, let's say it was just a bar, but there were 26 of them. They realised that 
the ends might start to wear down over time which meant that everyone's might be slightly different depending on how that happened so they made another bar which was slightly longer with lines in it right then they realized oh depends how it's displayed though or how it's kept so that might mean it might bend in the middle which will affect the distance so we've got to have another bar which is positioned in the same ways for everybody and they changed the bar again so it's this funny story of like how this meter went through all of these different changes but it was incremental and now where it's at now is it's not even like the standard or the the main thing that measures a meter that it's based on isn't actually a thing that someone's made it's a measurement of the light waves emitted from a certain type of krypton which is ridiculous to think that it's gone that far going from a guy a bunch of guys that went from mountain top to mountain top shining lights <laughs> right you know that just thinking of it like that where it's gone from a very physical thing regardless of the ab abstract thought involved to something that's incredibly abstract which is involved with incredibly abstract thought as well <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right, but they are confident they somewhere there is an accurate idea of what a meter is. They've got yeah, apparently they've got it now. That's what Wikipedia says. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in 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 terms of the Exeter measure, yeah, it, you were planning to walk the whole le uh, length of Devon, and, and you got about yeah. halfway. Is that yeah. is that a fair yeah. summary? Of it's more than fair. Yeah, I, I started in Brixham, which is the bottom part of the Devon, the bottom part of Devon that the because what I did, I created an Exeter Meridian, which is basically drawing a north-south line through the gallery space in Phoenix, because that's my base, you know, I said, right. oh, that's my base as the right. So then, you know, right. make my own Meridian. It started in Brixham, ended in Minehead. That was the, so the plan was then walk with a metre wheel from Brixham to Minehead, measure it, and then figure out what your measurement's going to be. So that's the that, that that's the right. one, that's the game right. I set up for myself. Right. So that's the intention. That was the intention. Yeah. And then what happened after that was well, the work. Right. I guess. <laughs> right. And and that was uh, uh, I managed to measure f uh, about fifty kilometres on the pedometer. It was to, until I got to Sheldon. So I measured about, I measured about, I measured to Sheldon on the measuring wheel, and then I lost hope uh, in why I was doing that. I thought I just lost the the reason for doing it. While talking to a doctor who was doing a bit of research on a walk to do with a a partner, and um, I took a pedometer with me as well and that was to try and give a different type of measurement right so i thought i'll involve technologies uh i lost that i don't remember where i lost it but i got up to about forty-seven thousand steps before i know i'd lost it that was the last time i looked at it um and in the end i stopped walking when I got to Exeter and I drove to Minehead on the M5 instead because yeah I sort of but it's and what, you kept a record of what the mileage was from the car I didn't do that you know oh. because by that point I'd just given up on that <laughs> on the measuring side of things I'd given up right because what it be, what it had become was this thing of just talking about what I'd done and what I'd researched and what I was trying to do in what was going on in that walk and I realised that that was then the work because I started to think you know if I just walk from if I just walk from Brixham to Minehead with the measuring wheel I might get how far I've walked but it's sort of like a sponsored walk by the Arts Council is what it would have felt like mm. because a lot of it would have been really boring really boring where I, and to be honest it would almost be a bit like I'm a celebrity get, get me out of here <laughs> but with an artist involved because I would have been suffering by by about three more days in I think my blisters would have been hell the the rain started to pour down and I started to think well in one in one way I just didn't want to do that 
I just didn't actually want to do that. <laughs> and uh, because it would have been miserable and dangerous as well, actually, because if I'd have followed the... What happened from Brixham to Exeter was that I reached the north of Torquay and there's the Tynmouth Road. There's no pavement on Tynmouth Road. And it becomes a country road. And if I'd have gone down that with all of the... I had about 20 kilograms of stuff, right. two backpacks. And if I'd have gone down that road with all of that on me... I would have been. I wouldn't have been perfectly balanced, and I could have got hit by a car. It's possible. And I thought I don't really want to do that, so I ended oh, up doing the southwest coast path instead, which felt just like a bit of a cop out. It was quite leisurely, but that was, you know, what was quite nice about that was that I ended up going to, going through Dawlish, which was where the, um, the, the storms were last year, wasn't right, it? Right. Yes. Which started to ruin the train track. Yes. Which is a strong part of Devon's identity from outside of Devon in terms of like maybe postcards and things because mm. that and that's one of the strengths of what um, one of the strengths of what that bit of train track does is that it's not just it's not even the quickest way is it because wasn't there a, another way through Dart or somewhere uh, north there was a way through well there was a, there's, I think there's a plan for a way through Oakhampton yeah which I don't think they completed. Yeah. So and there's a there's also a route through the Teen Valley, which is too wobbly apparently to oh, okay. to go fast. Ah. But anyway, they're they're exploring all of that. They're doing that now, I'm guessing. Yeah. But I mean, that that that, that bit of train track at that time would have been, it's it's iconic as an image. It's an iconic thing. And sure. What, and and I found it quite interesting, just going there to start thinking about how, you know, that their intention of what that train track was for. And 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 sort of where they're at with it now, because you know, obviously storms haven't been that bad before. Otherwise, it would have happened before, maybe. Or maybe is it just due to degradation that it's happened? I, d I doubt that. But I well, don't really know. I, we don't know. No, we don't know. We don't know at all. Yeah. Um, no, we're we're, ho we're hoping to get somebody from the Met Office in at some point. And that's yeah. one of the questions we'll ask. Yeah. Because it's it's a, 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 so they seem to have stopped talking about global warming and they're talking about climate change now. Yeah. So it may not be actually warmer. It just may be windier or wetter. Or well, that's, yeah, I think that's the thing. So there's all it? sorts yeah. of things. Yeah, it's not it's not as simple as warmth, is it? Because it's about it is about climate. It's about uh, ecosystems, and that's one of the things that like I think. Yeah, like it's hard to understand. How one thing will affect another. Again, it comes at that. Do it, do it start. It feel, that that's you know going on a walk. What's good about walking is you're in an environment, aren't you? And when you're in an environment, unless it's indoors and you've got air conditioning, there's a lot of external factors that play into what you're doing. And yes, weather's a big one of those. You know, it just is. And it's there's a there's a there's a guy that um, he's he's writing a lot about ecology and how we should think about it or how he th thinks we should think about it it's called Timothy Morton and his latest book's called Hyper Objects and that's all about that thing of how you know like cloud forms are an object uh, but they're everywhere and they're so big we can't see them all at once and how do we understand that then you've got the sun as well and that's another hyper object it's a massive thing that's doing its thing how is that interacting with clouds, which have been affected by all these other factors? It's it's not simply as simple as global warming, like you say, is it? It's, there's climate change, but what is that? And how much can that even be predicted? It's, it's quite a tricky thing. And that's what one of the one of the conversations I had was with a a, a lady from the Met Office that works with. This is for the book. One of the ladies that works at the Met Office. Um, to use dispersion models to map out how volcanic ash will um, move once a certain volcano might erupt. But she says, you know, we use these models which are like, you know, technologies, they're, they're algorithmic patterns. Right. But they're just, they're just, a, they're just a, they're like a sketch before the thing actually happens. And they're to give a, a rough guide, but other factors you can't even control in that, that are in the environment around it, will yeah. play into it. And yeah. it's hard to even yeah. know what that we have yeah. at that time. Yeah, no, I, I think science is prediction. They, yeah. they, they say a lot about chaos very quickly after <laughs> they claim they can predict anything. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> Seems to be. But then, just my impression. Yeah. Well, then the funny thing that com- came from that when we were chatting was the the responsibility that's placed on artists, not artists, on scientists, the other creative people. Everyone's creative. Shouldn't be saying it like that. But like, there's always the thing of art and science, isn't there? That they're like these like opposing fields. But well, some some seem to think that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so that like, there's a responsibility on scientists' shoulders now to do with predicting in that way was wasn't wasn't there those those guys in I don't know where it was in Europe or Asia where there was a plane crash to do with something that could have been predicted and the scientists behind the the team that could have predicted that ended up going to court for it or something 